Well, today I want to continue uh, with Matthew chapter 6 on the Lord's Prayer, but I want to specifically talk about uh, forgiveness. Is that okay? I want to specifically talk about forgiveness. And uh, so we're in Matthew chapter 6. And we'll just begin here in verse 8, and we'll get down to that portion. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask. Thank you, Father, that you do. Verse 9, in this manner pray, or in this way pray. This is how you pray. He's not telling us, say this prayer, by the way, folks. You know that? He's not saying, say this prayer after me. He's saying, in this manner, pray. I'm laying down principles, the Lord says. I'm going to emphasize and underline certain things that ought to be an outline in your heart and in your mind when you go to pray. In the beginning of this outline, the way you begin to pray is you, you say, Our Father, a Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, what this means is that when you pray in this outline that the Lord puts in our mind, this is how he prays. In his outline, He's more concerned about God being honored and glorified, worshiped and adored than he is his own personal request. Now you stop and think about that. Who's greater, you or the Lord who's teaching this? The Lord who's teaching this. And if he's saying that he in perfect righteousness and holiness, sin, uh, sinless, if he's saying that when I have a need and I come before my Father, I'm not about my need. I'm not about my request. I'm about my Father first. I have to acknowledge who He is. He is my Father who arts in heaven. Hallowed be His name. His name must be kept holy even when I pray. Now that hurts me because there was a time that because I was inundated with a lot of false teaching that when I prayed, uh, sometimes I would pray things that when I look back at it, they didn't glorify God at all. They didn't honor him at all. They didn't really have his mind at heart, had my own mind at heart. So I'm not spending a lot of time here, but just remember, when you go to pray, you don't have to stop and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. No, that's mechanical. We don't do that, okay? But you remember that Jesus said when he prays, you're going to pray like he prays. And he always begins by putting the Father first, by honoring him by recognizing who he is, recognizing that he's in heaven, he's in that superior place and position above all. And you're bowing your knee, you're bowing your heart before him. That's the attitude of your heart when you come to pray, when you say, Our Father. You're reminded that you have a relationship with him, he wants to help you, and you remind yourself that he's in heaven, that he's above all, he's separate from all, meaning in the, in the light of who he is. No, there's no one like the Lord. And you remind yourself of that. And you remind yourself that you're praying that his kingdom would come and that his will would be done because what's important to God must be important to you. And he's letting you know right, right away what's important to him when you come to him with a request. What's important to him is that his kingdom come, which we talked about just before the offering, that his kingdom come and that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then he allows us to go to our own needs. And he says in this prayer that you say, give us this day our daily bread. And that just is the Lord is teaching us here. Now it's time for you to talk about your needs. Your daily bread is your most basic need. Your basic need is the needs of necessity. So if you can you think of anything besides a basic necessity as your basic bread? Well, how about your health? Exodus chapter 23, verse 25, Stacy will put it up here for you. Exodus 23, verse 25, it says that the Lord will bless your bread and your water. And what will he do? He'll take sickness from the midst of you. Take sickness from the midst of you. Deuteronomy, she'll put that up now. That's chapter 7, verse 15. It says that there the Lord will take sickness away from the midst of you there as well. And then in Exodus chapter 15, verse 26, 
He says, obey me and keep my statutes, which you and I do by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and keeping his love commandment. And he said that the sicknesses and diseases that he's brought upon the Egyptians, he will not bring upon you because he is the Lord, your God, that heals you. In this passage of scripture, give us this day our daily bread. He's talking about your basic necessities. If you don't have the basic necessity of health, you don't need bread. You don't need clothing. You don't need anything else that Jesus will talk about later that comes uh, under the heading of the basic needs of life. Now, you got to remember, your, your basic needs of life might be something different than God's basic needs, your, his idea of your basic needs. You might think a, a house on a hill. You might think a, of a great big car or a new boat or something like that. That's not basic necessities. You might think lots of money. That's not basic necessities. What it takes for you to live on this earth to serve God is your basic necessities. And he will supply your every need, your basic necessities, according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. And I'd like to just remind you that each and every one of us in this room, you can turn to your heavenly father Anytime that you feel a sickness coming on you and you can say, Father, for your namesake and for your glory and your namesake and your glory alone, I'm asking you to make well my body. Now, do you notice I said for your namesake? Some people have argued that this prayer, the Our Father, is not a New Testament prayer. They say it was a prayer for the people that were listening to Jesus in those days. And then when Jesus returns and he sets up his kingdom in Israel, it'll be, it'll be reintroduced to be the prayer in that day, which is a bunch of baloney from Mahoney. The fact of the matter is, the name of Jesus is mentioned in this prayer. Because no one can say, Our Father, unless they have called upon the name of the Lord and is saved. So indirectly, it is implied that it's involved with this prayer. No, but not, not any person on this world in this world can say our father in faith they can say our father when i was a little boy i wasn't a christian i was a catholic i could say our father hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done i could say glory be i could say hell and mary i could say all kinds of these things but that just did it mechanically but now as a christian i don't say my prayers mechanically i say them out of a heart that's in fellowship with my heavenly father and I pray to him in Jesus' name because I know it's because of the name of Jesus that I have been forgiven, that I have been reconciled to God, that I have been justified, and his spirit is at work within me, changing my life each and every day, preparing me for that day when Jesus will return and my body will be glorified and resurrected, and so will yours. But God does all that he does for his namesake. Now, I remember years ago sitting in uh, uh, faith conferences and people were teaching on prayer, and they would say, you never pray, never, never, ever pray for, my, for uh, God's namesake. You always say, it's not for his sake, it's not his sake that he needs it, it's for your sake. Now that sounds good, doesn't it? But the, the, what they missed right there, they, didn't, they missed exactly what Jesus was talking about in the Our Father, when he says, Our Father, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The, the poor the first principle laid out in that first portion of that prayer is that God is to be honored. And so when people would say, in your name, for your namesake, it meant that you would be honored and glorified in the answering of this prayer and bestowing this blessing. For example, Ezekiel, uh, Stacy, 36, 22. You just have to see this. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, Ezekiel 36, 22. Thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy namesake. What's the Our Father say? In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. He says, I don't do it for your sake, but I do it for my holy namesake. What does the prayer say? Our Father, hallowed, holy is your name. So the old timers years ago that are being criticized by some people that, that think they know more than Jesus knows here in the Our Father, says you never pray 
for my for for Jesus name's sake or for God's name's sake you pray for uh, in Jesus name because it's for your sake no when they say in your name for your name's sake they're meaning that God might be honored and glorified in this prayer O house of Israel but for my name's sake which you have for you have profaned my name among the nations wherever you went now Psalm 79 9 you have to see this everybody this will bless you Psalm 79 9 here's someone praying he says help us O God of our salvation have you ever been that place in your home oh I need your help so this is what's happening this is a believer praying help us O God for uh, oh God for our salvation for the glory of your name, deliver us and provide atonement for our sins for your name's sake. For whose name's sake? For your name's sake. Psalms 25, verse 11. We're about ready to talk about forgiveness. And here it says in Psalms 25, 11, For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. For whose name's sake? For your name's sake, hallowed be thy name. For your name's sake, may your kingdom come and your will be done. For your name's sake, give us this day our daily bread. For your name's sake, lead us not into temptation. For your name's sake, deliver us from evil. So I'm here to tell you that what I was taught many, many years ago, never ever to say that phrase, for that's a phrase of unbelief. Are you kidding me? It's not a phrase of unbelief. The people who taught me that just did not know, see the truth. A person cannot teach or preach what they do not know. And I've learned this. There was a time in my heart I had a kind of an angst inside me towards people that taught me wrong. Why did they do that to me? I was sincere. I really wanted to learn and grow. And they gave me all this stuff. And I got to go through all of this. And I got upset about it. I have to be honest with you. I knew I had unforgiveness in my heart about all of that. And if you listen to me teach and preach, some of that would jump out on, on, on me. But the Lord finally got through to my head. He says, you cannot teach and preach what you do not know. And a lot of people with good hearts were teaching and preaching what they thought was right. Not everything that's false necessarily comes from a false teacher. Okay? It doesn't necessarily come from a false teacher. It comes from a person that just doesn't know. I know things in my life that I taught that are not correct. But I didn't know any better. I was sincere as, as could be. I wanted to do right as much as I want to do right right now. But I didn't know. So you have to be merciful and gracious with people around you. Okay? You have to be. Don't you want people to be gracious and merciful to you? As you do unto your neighbor, do, as you'd have, do, do unto your neighbor as you'd have your neighbor to do unto yourself. The old golden rule. So I have a lot of mercy in my heart. I got a lot of latitude towards Christians and preachers. As long as they're preaching that Jesus uh, is the source of our salvation, I'm fine with that person. That person is not a false teacher. You got to figure out what is a false teacher. A false teacher is somebody who doesn't believe that salvation is from Christ. Okay, that's the bedrock of a false teacher. A false teacher denies the Lord who has purchased us. Now, teachers can get a hold of a lot of false things. And a lot of false things get into the church is because Jesus is not being exalted as the source of our salvation. The bedrock cornerstone of the Christian faith Faith is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He came from heaven, sent by God to bleed, suffer, and die on the cross. He was raised from the dead and he ascended into heaven. In other words, that is the roots of everything. And that has to be proclaimed loud and clear so everybody knows where you stand on that issue. Here's another one right here. Psalms 31, Stacy. Psalms 31, verse 3. Listen to this. Have you ever asked the Lord for guidance and direction? I have. And this all goes along with the Lord's Prayer. I'm, I, I may not get to forgiveness because we've got to leave before the snow shakes. But it says here, 
Psalms 31.3, you are my rock and my fortress. See how you, the, the prayer begins with who God is? You're my rock. You're my fortress. You're my strength. You're my shield. You're my everything. You're my life and the length of my days. You're God. See how it starts out? He said, he goes on to say, therefore, your therefore for your namesake, lead me and guide me. Lead me and guide me. How many times do you want guidance and you're looking for leading and guidance? You don't know what to do. Turn to the Lord. Remind yourself. That's really what this prayer does. It helps you to remind yourself who you're talking to. You're talking to somebody that the Bible says there's no one like unto the Lord. No one like unto him. He needs nothing from anybody. Nobody can add or subtract anything from him. And you're, you need to be led and guided. And so before you put, I need to be led and guided, you put him ahead of yourself. This is the way Jesus prayed. Jesus always put God the Father above anything he had to pray for. That's the simple principle. Now, I've been teaching on this. I even got confused on this, Rick. I thought to myself, every time I have to pray, I have to say, Our Father, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, the Lord's friend, wake up, kid. Wake up. Wake up. No, I'm teaching you a principle. Can you get the principle? I'm not a very smart person. But I, the Lord has given me grace to keep on chugging. Keep on chugging. Keep on digging. Keep on looking. Keep on trying to find out what the Lord is trying to say here. And that's what he's trying to tell us. He has to be first. Before you pray, put him first. Remind yourself who he is. Remind yourself when you think about him, wow, hallowed be thy name. You are God. You're my God. You're my rock and my fortress. And for your name's sake, lead me and guide me, Lord. For your name's sake, lead and guide me. Not for my sake. Not so everything will turn out right for me. So everything ultimately will turn out right for God. What if something turns out right for you, but it doesn't turn out right for God? See, you might think a lot of things are right. This is the way it ought to go. This is the way it ought to happen, right? But who really knows the way it ought to go and the way it ought to happen? <laughs> the Lord alone knows that. Remember, remember uh, Paul? He says, uh, we decided to go this way, and the Holy Spirit forbid us. And we decided to go this way, and, and we didn't go that way. And then all of a sudden, we didn't know where to go, and we got a vision. And someone said, come on over here. Remember that? They wanted to go different places. A lot of times in life, you want to go different places, but it's not the place you ought to go. God's not in that place you want to go. You want to be in the place that God wants you to go. Did you hear that? And so you ought to just write this down. Put it in your refrigerator for a while. Psalms 31.3, for you are my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for your namesake, lead me and guide me. What will happen? I'll be where the Lord wants me to be. Can you say amen? amen? Psalms 109, Stace. Put that up there. Psalms 109, verse 21. I don't know if you ever prayed this prayer before, but I pray this prayer quite often. This is a good one, Brooks. This is a good one. Pray this prayer tonight before you fall asleep. Psalms, 29, uh, Psalms 109, 21. But you are God... But you, O oh God, are the Lord. So see how he's reminding himself who the Lord is? He's following this principle, isn't he? When Jesus taught the Our Father, what he taught was already in the Scriptures. It was already back there in the Old Testament, guiding and directing those that would pray. It says, Psalms 109, 21, But you are God, the Lord. Deal with me for your namesake. Because of your mercy is good deliver me deal with me for your namesake how many times do I'm, I'm out for a walk with my dog or just out doing something and i'll say lord you must deal with my heart you must deal with my mind i don't like where i'm at i don't like where i'm at i don't like where i'm going somehow in my heart in my mind in my life i know i'm not where i need to be and so i'm asking you for your namesake deal with me then I always remind the Lord, and because of your mercy is good, deliver me. Why do you say that? 
Because, see, sometimes when the Lord deals with you, he chastens you. And I don't know about you, but I've been chastened a lot in my life as a Christian by the Lord. And there's sometimes I've been chastened by the Lord. It hurts so much. I tell you what, I just walk around crying. Because I was chastened by the Lord. He's reproving me and rebuking me over things. Sometimes it's hard to stand up to it. And now when I say, Lord, deal with me according to your namesake, but I always say, Lord, remember your mercy, because you know how easy it is for me to get broken up over all this when you start dealing with me. I says, Lord, if you have to chasten me again, do it because you love me, but please help me. Help me, carry me through this whole time when you're chasing me. Carry me through this whole thing because, Lord, I need to know your mercy in the midst of your chastening. He always does. He's always so good to me. He's always, he's always going to be good to you. And then the last one I have for you is this. Psalms 4311. Psalms 4311. All this studying I did on forgiveness, I'm not going to be able to give it to you guys. Because the snow is going to start spraying here pretty soon. Psalms 43.11 says, Revive me. Oh, Lord, for your name's sake. I want you to stop right there. People are praying for revival. Some people are praying for revival because they want to see the manifestations of the Spirit. They want to see all the goodies that come with revival. Ooh. And it's good. It is good. I have to say it's really good. But you can have it for the wrong reasons. You could want things for the wrong reasons. It's like you want to be guided for the wrong reasons. He says, revive me, O Lord, for your namesake. And for your righteousness sake. In other words, revive me, pour out your Holy Spirit for your namesake and for your righteousness sake. For your plans and for your purposes. For what you want to see to be done. I wonder if some people really like to see a revival. Because some revivals would cause some churches to just be the end of that church. Some revivals would call churches to grow. Some, church, uh, uh, some revivals bring great sorrow for a season of repentance before the joy of salvation and the joy of thanksgiving and praise breaks out as salvation comes forth. We always think about revival as just a time of joy, but sometimes it be, it's, it's prefaced on a time of great sorrow and contrition. You know, there's been stories about people under the conviction of the Holy Spirit for days, weeks, months, and even some people up to a year. Can you imagine being under conviction of sin that long? You and I, as modern day Christians, we don't think of these things because you know we maybe don't read books on revival on books on what has happened in the past what God has done in the past you know in your Bible in the New Testament you read about Ananias and Sapphira they were living during a time of revival weren't they and you know what happened to them they died because they were judged by God they were asked, to told, asked a question, did, did you do this and this and that and the other thing? They said, yes, we did. And the husband died. They took him out and buried him. A little while later, they asked the wife, did you do this or that, the other thing? Well, she said, yeah, we did. And then she died. You know why you don't see much of that happening today in the church? Because there's not that great outpouring of the Holy Spirit that you read about in the book of Acts. When that great outpouring of the Holy Spirit comes... A lot of us thought we really tasted something during the charismatic movement. We did. We tasted something beautiful and wonderful. But you've got to remember, you go through church history, revivals are like little campfires, little stove fires, like bonfires, like forest fires, like huge fires. It, it, they come in different, 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 different measures. I pray that God gives us the biggest measure of all. He pours out his spirit upon the church, that the church will be cleansed and purified. But I pray that he do it for his namesake and for his righteous sake to bring our souls out of trouble. Because there's a lot of souls in trouble, everybody. There's souls in trouble that are in the church. They think they're a Christian and they're not a Christian. Their soul is in trouble. There's a lot of our children who think they're Christians because our mom and dads are Christians but their soul is in trouble. 
There's a lot of our neighbors and our friends that they think they're okay with God, but their soul is in trouble. And the only thing that will bring them out of trouble is a great revival for his namesake and for his righteousness' sake. Let's just close right there. Heavenly Father, we bow our hearts and our heads before you, and we ask you through the Lord Jesus Christ that you would glorify your name in answering our prayers today. Father, that you would hear us for your name's sake and for your righteousness' sake, Father, that you would move into our hearts here present this morning and that you would revive us unto you again in the name of Jesus, that we would receive a great quickening within our hearts to know you and to love you and to fear you and to honor you and to put you first before ourselves, before our spouses, before our children, before our workplace, before anything and everything that you would be honored as first in our life. We pray, Father, that you would revive us for your namesake and for your righteousness sake, that we would be a people that would love holiness and love righteousness and would thirst and hunger for you to make it our ever reality in our life. Something that's growing and maturing in us all the time for your glory. We ask you for your namesake and for your righteousness sake to do the same in our children. If they're not saved, Father, bring them out of darkness and cause them to be saved. If they are saved and they're mediocre and they're just placating, we ask you, Father, to set a fire inside their souls in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask you, Father, for everyone in this church family, Father, that you would move us out of mediocrity, out of lethargicness, that you would cause us to be fervent in our hearts, serving the Lord with great zeal given to us as a gift from God. We ask you, Father, to help us to hunger and thirst more for the Word of God and fellowship with you in prayer and worship. Father God, that we, you would bring good, solid, rock-solid Christian literature into our, uh, our homes, that we can study the doctrines of the Bible, study the truth of the Word of God, things that will feed us, that are not littered with, with all kinds of false teachings and false doctrines. Father, guide us and direct us and cause us to be a burning light in this world, in Jesus' name. A city set on a hill, Father, for your namesake and for your righteousness' sake, O Lord God. Do this, we pray. For your namesake and for your righteousness, lead us each and every moment of the day, Father. Guide and direct us. Guide us in the workplace. Guide us in our marriage. Guide us in our family. Guide us in our homes. Guide us as we witness and testify to others in Jesus' name. Give us boldness for your namesake. Courage for your namesake. To give the faith of Jesus Christ away to others in Jesus' name. And Lord God, for your namesake and for your glory alone, for your righteousness' sake, Lord, have mercy upon us and forgive us our sins. Forgive us our transgressions. Forgive us of our laziness and our mediocrity. Forgive us, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Lord, renew, rekindle that hunger for you and for spiritual things in our life in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we ask you for your name's sake and for your righteousness' sake to show yourself as the Lord our God, our healer. Keep us from the virus. Keep us from all manner of sickness and disease in the name of the Lord Jesus. Lord, help us to be quick to repent and quick to forgive. Father, uh, when we offend somebody, that we would repent and go to them and say, I apologize, I'm wrong, please forgive me. Let forgiveness flow, Father. Let reconciliation take place in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, if any one of us are grieving you over anything, Lord, and we don't know about it, chasten us and show us in our hearts where we're stepping the wrong direction and lead us on that path that's straight and narrow and righteous and holy in your sight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. For your name's sake and for your glory and for your honor, Lord, do this, we pray, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, we need you. We are so dependent upon you. Our life, our days, our years, our breath, is in your hands. We ask you to keep us, Lord, and cause us to be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, in the precious name of Jesus. Cause our hearts to be burning inside with a love that, that could never grows cold, a love for you, Heavenly Father, a love for your people, a love for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and a love for lost souls. We ask you for this help, your help, Father, for your namesake, for your honor, and for your glory. And we believe, Father, that you hear us because of Christ. 
Now unto you, Father, to belongs all glory and honor and blessing. We bless you today in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be honored and glorified forever and ever. Amen. Praise the Lord.